I need to release this to you guys because I think it's just so important right now for each and every one of us to understand this. With everything going on in the church globally right now, there is a lot of information coming at you. There's a lot of different things that you are going to see. And one of the most important things that I think can cause confusion in the body of Christ is the subject of spiritual maturity. So what is spiritual maturity? Who really is spiritually mature? And it's interesting because I think that many of us have a premeditated idea of what spiritual maturity truly is. And in fact, I'll go as far as to say that there's no doubt that spiritual maturity is seen differently by different groups within the body of Christ itself. Just within the church, spiritual maturity on one side looks like this, and spiritual maturity on the other side looks like something completely different. What's really interesting is Paul addresses the subject without saying spiritual maturity. He addresses the subject so plainly and so perfectly in the book of Corinthians. And I'm going to dive into that with you this morning. What I do want to say, and this is really important, just to give you a little bit of background, and the truth is if I had time, I would really love to go through the entire book of Corinthians with you. It's one of those books that I've studied so much because it's part of what God has called us to do as a church when it comes to ministering certain aspects of the book of Corinthians. have been such an important part of our ministry. Uh, so I've just, I've dived into it and dived into it over the years and, and just really been through it. And God has put it so heavy on my heart, this particular subject. And I just feel right now that it's so important for us to be looking for the right things when we make a judgment on what truly is spiritually mature or not. The book of Corinthians was written around 54 to 55, 56 AD, somewhere around there. Paul is the author of the book of Corinthians. Most scholars agree that he wrote the book of Corinthians while he was in Ephesus. It wasn't that long after the church was established in Corinthians that he wrote this letter to the church. The reason, the primary reason why he wrote this letter was because he'd received some concerning information about what was taking place in Corinthians and wanted to put some things in order. Now, there's a lot more to it than what I'm just going to share with you this morning. I'm only going to share a part with you. But it, but it was a very important message that he had for us. And I truly believe to the church today, this is so vitally important for us to grasp. So with all of that said, let's go straight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. We're going to pick it up in verse number 3. Don't put it on the screen yet. The reason why we're starting in verse 3 is because there's a lot of content this morning. Already in the first service, I left out a lot of my notes because I just want to show you something important this morning without getting into all the other things that surround it. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 and 2, it's literally just a greeting. He literally greets them. And now in verse 3, he's about to commend them. You will see that when Paul writes all his letters to the churches, he writes them with a commendation. He commends them for what they have done and what they are doing well. Very nice. Before he gives them a good kick in the bottom. Okay, that's how he writes. He starts by first telling them, listen, you guys are doing this so well, and I commend you for, your, for, your, for, for the different things that you're doing. In each letter that he writes, he writes differently because obviously each church is in a different place. Now, let's pick it up in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. So we know this is right at the beginning. So you must understand that by writing this right in the beginning, he is setting the stage for the entire letter. He's setting the foundation for what he's about to get into. Now watch what he says. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Now it's about to get really good. That you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
This is how he starts the letter. And I don't know about you, but what a great start. I mean, he tells them, listen, you guys are so enriched in everything. He says that, he says that you have been given all utterance and all knowledge. Now, I want to stop right there. When it comes to spiritual maturity, knowledge is often the gauge for spiritual maturity. You know, well, you know, that pastor or that church or that believer, you know, he can quote the whole Bible. He is so, not, he is so spiritually mature. You know, he knows the entire word. And listen, it's great to know the whole word and it does help with your spiritual maturity. But Paul starts and he says, listen, he says, you guys are enriched in everything, in all utterance and all knowledge. So powerful. He says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirming, so that you come short in no gift. Now let's move over to the other side of the spectrum. Because there are many in the church that judge spiritual maturity based on gifting. And especially spiritual gifting. And we know this because Paul's going to address spiritual gifting later on in the letter. So the context is very clear. He's talking about spiritual gifting. So in the church today, when we see someone walk out and there's power and there's prophecy and there's all that stuff, we, ooh, he's so mature and so anointed and he probably is anointed. And yes, there is some maturity for him to have gotten to that place, no question. Both of these things, honestly, are important when it comes to spiritual maturity. So Paul is saying, listen, you guys. Now listen, he's talking to the Corinthian church. As far as I'm concerned, they're doing pretty well right now. How many of you agree? All knowledge, all utterance. We can get into utterance, but I don't want to spend all morning with you. He says that you guys come short in no gift. In other words, as a, as a congregation that's moving forward, you are moving in the right direction. You guys are awesome. Spiritually, right? Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to just jump to verse 10. You can read it. The context doesn't change at all. Verse 10. Watch this now. Now I plead with you, brethren. Everybody stop and look at me. How many of you think what he's about to say is important? I mean, he's just told them, listen, you guys, you have all the knowledge. You guys have all the gifting. You understand all the stuff. You are really amazing. But now I'm pleading with you. The letter is about to go from commendation to let's get serious. Because what I'm about to tell you is really, really, really important. He says, I'm pleading with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think there is another plea in any of his letters quite like this one. So this is important. He says that you all speak the same thing. And that, you, and that there be no division among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I want you to see that he, 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 he says, listen, I'm pleading with you. He says that you guys, that there's no division among you. So that means that unity in the church must be really important. He says, he says, he says that there be no division and that you speak the same thing. Man, I can speak. We could, this subject of speaking the same thing, being in unity, flowing as one, is so vitally important to where God wants to take us. But when the church is not working that way, we cannot move forward as a body. And he knew the seriousness of what this could potentially do to this church. So he's pleading. And saying, listen, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now watch. For it has been declared to me concerning you. So we know he's been, Paul's been warned about this. He's been told about this. 
It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentious contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, yeah, he's about to tell us what these contentions are. Each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Now let's stop for a moment. He says there's, a, there's some division, and he begins to immediately address this issue of how some of them are saying that I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, Apollos, who was Apollos? I'm so glad you're asking. Apollos was basically a preacher from Ephesus who was an incredibly eloquent man and had the ability to really preach to the Jews and convince them that Jesus was the Christ. He was a really knowledgeable guy. And so Apollos, we know, had gone to Ephesus. The Bible actually tells us, I mean, to Corinthians. So we know that they had seen him. He had actually physically been there. But what's really interesting about this passage of text is that he also says, I am of Cephas. So there are some in the church that are saying, I am of Cephas. And who is Cephas? Cephas is Peter. Cephas is the apostle Peter. They are saying that I am of Cephas. Some are saying I am of Paul. And then some really are saying this, that I am of Christ. And Paul's saying this is a problem. You wouldn't think this is a problem, but this is a problem. Why? Because what's happening is everybody's coming in. And let's just, let's just make it simple. Okay, back then, there was only one denomination. Right? I mean, it was still early. Okay? So there was only one denomination. And within that one denomination, there was already people saying, listen, I've been taught by Paul, and Paul's way is the right way. Or today it would be like this. I was listening on the internet last week to this pastor from Texas, and actually, I'm from there. I think he's right. You all listen way too much to the internet nowadays. So what happens is they're starting to say, listen, this doctrine or this person, this is, I believe what he says, what he says is right, what you say isn't right. So there's this division and everybody's saying that this one's right and that one's right and I'm from this church. I am of Apollos, I'm from this church. And the others are saying, listen, I'm from Christ. I don't need to go to church. I'm not gonna listen to what any man says, only what Jesus said. That's the only one who got it right. Come on, you have, some of you have done that. Amen, we've heard this. And this is a problem. He's saying there's division among you and the reason why there's division among you is because you are coming in with your ideas. Listen, Paul gets so upset about this that he actually says, Some, I only baptized like a couple of you. None, you were not really of me. That's actually what he says. So it was serious to him. This was, an, this, was, this was something that could cause great damage in the church. And the truth is that today, that's exactly what happens. They come to oceans. Pastor Alex, I'm from Washington. I know the way you need to do it. Come on, if you're from Washington, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> this is such a serious issue that when we go to 1 Corinthians 3, he's gonna dive into this so much more. Watch this now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, verse number one. It's about to get really good, okay? He says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Everybody look at me. Are we reading the same book of Corinthians? Because at the beginning of the book of Corinthians, he tells them how they have all knowledge, how they have all understanding, that they can understand all utterances, that they operate in all the gifts, and now he's calling them babies. He says, listen, 
I can't speak to you as spiritual people because you are carnal. What does carnal mean? The word carnal means fleshly. He is telling those who he commended for their spirituality and all their knowledge that they are still infants that need to drink milk. That means that all their knowledge and all their gifting doesn't make them spiritual. That was not the gauge for true spirituality. But yet today, that's exactly how we gauge spirituality. I have seen it, guys. Someone will come and preach here and everyone will be, ooh, want to follow him. Come on, that's how we are. I know you like that. I'll call you out. <laughs> or we get so impressed with the guys that seem to have all the knowledge and this scripture and that scripture. And yeah, and it's good. It's not bad. But that's not the gauge for spirituality. He's calling the church that he commends for all those things spiritual babies. Now, why does he do this? Let's just read it real quick. Verse two, I fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you were not able to receive it and even now you are still not able for you are still carnal for where there are envy, strife and division among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? In other words, what's happening is they're still behaving in a fleshly way like the people in the world, even in the church, they are jealous of each other, that's the word envy. They are full of strife, that's the word which speaks of contentions and, and friction. And there is division among them. They cannot get into unity. I plead with you that you have one mind. But instead, everybody thinks they've got the right way. They've got the answer. How can I say that? How can I be absolutely sure that that's the context? Take a look at the next verse. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? The church isn't moving as one because there are people within the church that think we need to do it another way. We need to do it the way that Paul did it, or we need to do it the way that Apollos did it. In other words, they're saying, listen, I'm, like, I'm from here. This is how it needs to be done. I'm from there. This is how it needs to be done. The only one who gets it right is me, guys. Come on now. I'm joking. I'm joking. But I just, you know. <laughs> I wish that were true, but it's not. Now watch what he says. He says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? So, What's important for us to understand is that when we operate with envy, when we operate and compare, when we operate this way, we are not actually spiritually mature. When we are doing this in the body of Christ, which we all have a tendency sometimes to do, what's happening to us is that we are actually operating like spiritual babies. And if this is what if this, is, if, if, if this behavior is not spiritual maturity, how do we truly see what real spiritual maturity looks like? We need to look at this. Let's go to Ephesians 4, verse number one. Ephesians 4, verse number one. I therefore, the prisoner of our Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So he tells us, listen, we need to, we need to work together. There is one spirit. We should all be bearing with one another in love and in peace. We're not always gonna agree on everything. That's okay. I'm normally right and you're wrong. No, that's not true. I'm just trying to get you to think. I want to make sure you're with me. The reality is, is that we will never always agree on everything. 
But the Bible does teach us what is right and what is wrong, and we should stick to that more than anything. So then what really proves spiritual maturity? How can we truly see in a church, in a believer, in our own lives, whether we are achieving spiritual maturity? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at what he says. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Everybody look at me. He is literally quoting what he told them in the beginning that he was commending them about. He says, I've got gifts. He says, I've got knowledge. I've got understanding. But if I haven't got love, I have nothing. He's told them that there's divisions and quarrels among them. And why is this taking place? Because the main problem or the main thing that's necessary is missing. What's the main thing? Love. Real, pure, true love. That's how you measure true spiritual maturity, with love. Take a look at what he says. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. What? This sounds like the perfect picture of love. You see, the truth is, is that the heart of man is really wicked, the Bible says. And in fact, it calls it desperately wicked. Wicked, who can know it? So the truth is, is that you can give all your goods away, you can look like you've got love, but the, tr the reality is that only God knows your real motive. And it goes like that with everything in the kingdom. Why are we really doing it? Why are we really operating when we operate, whether it be in giftings, whether it be with knowledge? Is it for our own self gain? That's why I am of Apollos. I am of Paul. Paul didn't even know the guys that were saying they're of Paul. So what was the thing? It was all about me. It was all about their own self-desire, their own self-gain, the way they think it has to be. And Paul is saying, listen, you can have all of that, but if you don't have real love, you have nothing. You can have all the gifts, you can have all the understanding, you can have all the knowledge, but without pure love, you have nothing. You can give all your stuff away. You can even die with the wrong motive and it will count for nothing. He says at the end of verse three, it, it profits me nothing. Now watch what real love looks like. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Everybody say truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. This is not talking about the end of the gifts, guys. This is not where cessation becomes a reality. Because if the gifts were done away with, then so would knowledge be done away with. What he's trying to say is that those are things that are all in part, but the main thing is love. That's the theme. Are you with me? So giftings and knowledge and all of that is really great, but the most important thing is that we truly operate with love. In verse 13, he says, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 
let me, let, me, let me show you something. Let me come down. The greatest threat to the church is not the devil. The greatest threat to the church is the church. Because historically, it's always within that destruction comes. If you have a look throughout history, the Israelites would normally suffer defeat at their own hands because of the things that they did wrong. The story of Balak and Balaam is the perfect example. This prophet, false prophet, whatever you want to call him, goes to the king because he's summoned by the king to curse the nation of Israel. He tries to curse the nation of Israel three times and cannot get it right because the word of the Lord comes to him and says, listen, whom God has blessed, no man can curse. You are the children of God now who God has blessed No devil, no man can curse you. And so afterwards, the king's all upset and the prophet says, listen, there is one thing you can do. Go put the pretty ladies from your city out before the men of Israel and they will sin against themselves. And the Lord, the Bible says, was displeased with this. And so destruction came. In scripture, you will see that it's it's when the church decides to bring disunity in the camp, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram decided that Moses wasn't doing his job right and that they were gonna bring division. And it caused the destruction of so many in the the camp of Israel. So it is in the church today, same thing. The, the, The greatest threat to us is ourselves. That's why Paul said, now I plead with you, brethren that you have one mind, that you stop with selfish ambition, that you stop with your own. I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. It's not about that, it's all about him. Are you guys with me? And we should stop being overly impressed with spiritual gifts and knowledge as important as they are on both sides. They are both equally important. But that's not the judge. The judge is what your true motive is, whether there truly is love at the motive of it or whether there isn't. And the perfect example of spiritual maturity is Jesus himself. Let me show you. He defines this perfectly. One of the teachers of the law come to Jesus. And this is what they ask him. They say to him in Matthew 22, verse 36. I'll give you a second to get there if you want to go there. Matthew 22, verse 36. Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? In other words, what is the most important thing here? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the end of it. But that's not where Jesus stops. He says, this is the, this is the first and greatest commandment. He says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This wasn't the question. The question is what's the most important thing. But Jesus brings up the second because he says it's equally important. He says the second is like it. It's equally important that you should love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know what real spiritual maturity looks like? That's what it looks like. Let me me paint the picture for you. Jesus said this. I did not come to do my own will, but to do do the will of him who sent me. Jesus loved God so much with his whole heart, with his whole soul, with all that was within him, that he was willing to live his life for the Father. That's love. Then the other thing that he did, the Bible says that there is no greater love than this, than to lay down your life 
for your friend. What is that? That's the second commandment. Jesus fulfilled both of them perfectly by loving God so much that he was willing to give his life and serve on earth with no self-motivation. Man, I could, I could say so many things. But watch this now. Look at what he finishes this off with. Verse 40. On these two command, commandments hang all the law. The law is the word, the knowledge, and, and the prophets, all the giftings, all the utterances. Love the Lord and love your neighbor and you will be spiritually mature. The law and the prophets is fulfilled in this. That's what spiritual maturity looks like. And how do you see that? It's very difficult to truly gauge whether someone really is operating in love. It's not that easy because you can fake it. That's why he said you can give all your, give, all your goods to the poor and you can even give yourself to be burned. But if the motive isn't right, it profits you nothing. That's why he knows your heart, guys. True spiritual maturity is someone that doesn't live for themselves. This is hard. Come on. This is difficult. I want to live for myself. Often, more than often. Come on, we all do if we're honest. Paul said, who will deliver me? From this wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from myself? That's your greatest challenge is to overcome yourself. And it's because of yourself that division takes place in the church, not you, but in general. Are you with me? And Paul's saying, you guys are missing it. You're looking at the knowledge and you're looking at the gifts and you think that's what determines what will truly, truly show us what Jesus is really all about. And he says, that's not what it is. Although I have tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I can have all utterances and all knowledge and understand all mysteries, but if I haven't got love, it profits me nothing. That's the key. And unfortunately, in the church today, we see it everywhere. Even at oceans, we see it. It happens. It exists. And if we're honest, we all carry a little bit of it. But God has a divine way. His word is perfect. In Corinthians 14, he begins to break it down and show us how to operate with gifts. And so much of the church rejects it because it makes them uncomfortable and doesn't fit their theology. But true love is all about the other person. True love is setting the captive free. True love is healing the brokenhearted. True love is, 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 that's why Jesus said, listen, love the Lord your God. And, and they go, oh, I can do that. I can do that. You can fake that, but you can't fake it when it comes to real people. It's going to eventually be seen. And that's, the, that's what it's all about. I look at you. This is what it's about. It's about you. You are his people that he loves so much. I better not mess it up as your pastor. Amen, brother. <laughs> I've got my amen. But just as much as that's a demand on me, it's a demand on you too. And I want to warn you as your pastor that does truly love you. I don't understand how, but I do. It's like the Lord puts it in me. I probably don't love you enough. I could probably love you a little bit more, okay? But the Lord is working on me all the time. And, it, and, and I realize every day that my greatest challenge is the thing that wakes up with me every day, which is me. Pastor Harold said to me many years ago, he said, Alex, if you can control yourself, you can control your environment. He said, you will make such an impact if you can if you can manage and govern yourself, your thoughts, your mind, your heart, which is a very difficult thing to do. 
But my prayer for us this morning is twofold. First of all, if you're sitting here this morning or maybe watching online, maybe it's you, don't get mad at me, that has brought division. Maybe it's your motives that haven't been good. And I wanna challenge you this morning to come before the Lord humbly because the Bible says that He gives grace to the humble. Or maybe you're sitting there and you are someone that has been hurt in the church. And if I had to ask you to raise your hands, I know it would be a very large percentage of you because unfortunately people get hurt in the church. There are too many Christians not in church anymore because they got hurt in church. We get it wrong, guys. We make mistakes. But ultimately, you have to answer to God. And I wanna challenge you this morning to let that hurt go. You must understand it's Satan's greatest strategy that the church will turn on the church so that there isn't true unity in the spirit. I don't have to be in a board meeting with the pastor down the road to be in unity. We can be in unity because we're both going in the same direction and we respect each other. So this morning, I want to challenge you to come before the Lord. We're gonna close our eyes. I'm gonna pray and give you a moment. If you need to ask for forgiveness, maybe you've caused the hurt. And if you're the one who's received the hurt because of things that happened to you in church, I'm gonna ask you this morning to let it go. You don't need to carry that anymore. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. For surely you are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, we want to be like Jesus that came to do the will of him who sent him, to do the will of our Father. We want to be like Jesus that would be willing to lay down our lives. It's my desire to be more spiritually mature and now I know what it looks like. It's a life of real sacrifice, which is hard for us to do. Even Paul said that it would be, who will deliver me? Who will deliver me from this body, from myself? Who will deliver me? So Father, we know that we have to fight this every day. But I thank you that your grace is sufficient and you show grace to the humble. Father, maybe it's us that has inflicted that hurt or pain on others because of our own motives. Or maybe we got hurt in the process from others. This morning, I pray, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of everyone in this place, the brokenhearted, that you would bind up and mend the wounds of those that, that are sitting here, maybe watching online. I know there are so many wounded believers because of things that took place in church. There is no perfect church. We, are all, we all make mistakes. But I ask, Lord, that you will help us that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning in this place. Just, I ask Holy Spirit, go right now, touch every person under the sound of my voice in this place, watching online, touch them now, heal the hearts, humble hearts, cause us to follow you, to serve you, and to desire you with all that is within us. I thank you for your grace, I thank you for your mercy, and I thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming out this morning. I pray you go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship with the Spirit. Have a wonderful week in Jesus' name.